So good afternoon. We are gathered here for a first session on the future of macro and uh, macro finance uh, theory and models. Um, let, me, uh, let me just say as a matter of introduction, not as a matter of introdu introducing the speakers, which I will not introduce because they are very well known and respected, but as a matter of introducing the uh, topics that um, it is, it is very prop proper that we start a discussion on the future of central banking with a discussion on the future of macro uh, and a discussion on theory uh, and models. And it is even more proper that we do it here uh, when we're all gathered to pay tribute to, to our Vice President Vitor. Uh, it is very proper uh, for central bankers to care about the, the future of macro and the future of modeling. We care a lot about models, theoretical models and uh, empirical models. To, uh, to quote or maybe to misquote Max Weber, we, uh, as central bankers, we uh, both have a, an ethics of responsibility and an ethics of conviction. The ethics of responsibility is about delivering on our mandate, which is bringing, in bringing inflation close to 2%. I'm sure, Vitor, you will agree with that uh, starting point. Um, and uh, the ethics of conviction, the, the Gesinnungs ethic, is about uh, doing policy based on first principles, uh, informed by facts, and framed by uh, sound uh, economic thinking, which is about having a sound macro framework and which is about having uh, good models. And we're doing it, seriously. Uh, and uh, Vitor has been leading the effort uh, here in the ECB to upgrade our models, uh, revamp uh, our macro thinking in the light of facts, as the president was saying, uh, in the light of the lessons we've learned from the uh, great financial crisis in particular, uh, introducing financial fr frictions in our models, uh, introducing uh, uh, hand to mouth uh, agents and uh, all kind of imperfections that we've, we've seen were important in the crisis. Um, and uh, it's not enough and that what we're going to discuss now is how to uh, make it uh, even uh, better. And I always like to start a discussion on models, theoretical models or empirical models by quoting General Eisenhower, uh, who famously said that planning, uh, plans are useless, but planning is of the essence. So being on the receiving side of that discussion, I very much believe that models are useless, but modeling is of the essence. Um, and I hope uh, I will be maybe proven wrong on the first account and confirmed on the second account. So uh, let me uh, open the floor uh, to uh, John Mulbauer uh, for the presentation of the first paper. Yes. And there should be slides. There are slides. And we click. See them here. Well, I greatly appreciate this opportunity um, to be here. And um, Mario Drachi said beautifully what I think about Vitor, just beautifully. Um, Vitor has been very patient with me, has given me lots of time. We've had some wonderful conversations, not just about economics, but also music. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to uh, contribute to this occasion. Right, um, th there is a paper. I'm going to talk about parts of the paper, just briefly the introduction. I'll skip the DSG, New Keynesian debate, most of it, but just touch on it. And then I'll talk about the positive aspects of what I want to talk about, which is financial stability and how evidence-based work um, that's a bit more open-minded um, can help. Um, improve our understanding of financial stability, integrate better with stress testing. And then, um, again, talk about the other big issue that central banks are concerned with, especially at the moment, which is the future of inflation, what drives inflation, is there a Phillips curve, and so on, and talk about some very recent work on modeling US inflation. So let me pay homage um, to begin with to two intellectual giants who've influenced me since the 1970s. Uh, one is Joe Stiglitz, the other one is David Hendry. Um, Joe's work on information economics had a profound effect on my thinking um, really throughout my professional life. 
um, he writes in his Nobel lecture um, that the attempts made to construct a new macro based on traditional microeconomics with its assumptions of well-functioning markets was doomed to failure. And he particularly highlights the issue of um, people who lose income and aren't able to maintain their consumption because they don't have access to capital markets, at least not on good terms. And a uh, second thing he says in his lecture is that information economics has alerted us to the fact that history matters. The path dependence is really important, um, something that Roger Farmer and I very much agree on. And dynamics are better described by evolutionary processes than by equilibrium. Now, David Hendry um, is my other big uh, influence. And just give you two quotes from him. Um, there's a false belief that data-based model selection is a subterfuge of scoundrels rather than the key to understanding the complexities of macroeconomies. Um, that's been a mantra, really, most of my life. Um, and then on economic forecasting, where he's done really the leading work of anyone. Um, understanding structural breaks, what you do when you're faced with a structural break, what you do afterwards um, is, is really, really important. So my brief comment about uh, the new Keynesian DSG is, well, it would have been nice. Um, it wasn't new, based on ideas made redundant by the asymmetric information revolution of Stiglitz and his colleagues. It wasn't Keynesian. It ignored coordination failures, um, particularly between the real economy and finance, and so useless for understanding financial stability. It wasn't dynamic enough, because the lag structures implied by these models really don't fit the world at all. And it was hardly stochastic, because stochastic is about statistical distributions. Um, radical uncertainty means in the time dimension, probability distributions are really quite different. And of course, cross-sectionally, heterogeneity is missing. And hardly gender equilibrium, because it missed most of the system feedbacks that are important. And then the assumptions of rational expectations into temporal optimization in a world that is subject to radical uncertainty and structural breaks um, has to be reformulated. So obviously repairs are necessary, and many people agree, and the ECB, among others, um, is leading um, in, this, in this work. Evidence, to me, is crucial. So there's lots of empirical evidence, of course, against the new Keynesian DSG model. The failure of aggregate consumption, the oil equation, something that Larry Christiana himself says is the most rejected equation in economics. Um, the mountains of new micro evidence on heterogeneity, credit constraints, buffer stock behavior, the influence of house prices on consumption in credit liberal economies, and of course the evidence against the new Keynesian Phillips curve, both micro and macro. Um, and then, you know, sadly, in, uh, in macro, evidence is seldom allowed to speak in the top journals. You have to go to the sub-journals, the specialist journals, to allow macro evidence to, to, um, to show up. And I think this is because of the pincer movement of the, the Lucas critique and the, the Sims critique, the incredible restrictions critique, which argued that we don't know what the theory is, so let's formulate a very, very general model and let um, the data speak that way. But of course, Bayesian VARs, which is what you have to, well, what the profession resorted to um, when faced with the curse of dimensionality, um, are subject to compromise by strong priors and uh, Bayesian restrictions. So let me turn to the positive side of, uh, of my talk, the first positive side. So I want to talk about financial stability and think about it in a very general way and think about how empirical work can help um, appreciate the risks and understand how to integrate with stress testing. So I'd like to divide uh, risks into three. So first of all, exogenous negative shocks. 
which for a small labor economy and really outside of the, the control of, of, of the policymakers. There could be a deterioration of the terms of trade. Uh, there could be a rising global interest rates. I mean, we haven't yet fully experienced the Trump shock, but um, who knows what that might do to global interest rates. Um, oh, there are oil shocks, external credit supply shocks, political risk, climate change, and a lot of things that small countries can't do anything about. The second thing they could do something about, which is the so-called fundamentals, things that look um, as part of the long-run solution, may be fragile. I think of duration mismatch in credit supply, currency mismatch of debt, unsustainably weak financial regulation. These are all things that could have been avoided <coughs> if the policymakers um, and the politicians had been on the ball. And then finally, the endogenous feedback loops, which can amplify risks. And the financial accelerator is, is what I'd like to talk about next. So let's think about positive and negative feedbacks. Let me start with the negative feedbacks, because obviously on the downside in a, in a crisis, the, this is what really matters. So the buildup of debt, especially if the quality of lending has deteriorated, weighs on spending. Um, a large expansion of the housing stock, which later weighs on prices, um, well, this is something that um, varies across countries in the same way as the quality of lending is something that varies across countries and across time. Um, a third negative feedback possibility is the increased saving for a down payment when house prices of income rise. And it's really interesting that this negative feedback loop is quite high in Germany and France, but low in the UK and the US. And so that has implications for the stability of those economies. Now, quite a lot depends on the timing of negative feedbacks relative to the positive ones. So let me turn to the positive ones. First of all, extrapolative, extrapolative expectations of capital gains matter more when high leverage is possible. And that makes sense from first principles. It's also something my empirical work shows. Leverage amplifies gains. There's a leverage cycle. Expected gains cause lenders to, to relax uh, conditions because of higher uh, Equity cushions make loans look safer. Um, profitable lending increases the capital base. The third positive feedback loop, uh, loop occurs through residential investment, something we certainly saw in Ireland and Spain and the US. Um, booms that boost employment and income, raising aggregate demand and feeding back. And then the fourth, the consumption channel. Um, in countries with easy equity withdrawal, large collateral effects on consumption uh, can occur. You know, think of the UK and the US. Um, but time varying in countries where equity withdrawal is not possible, that amplifying mechanism is absent. So thinking about heterogeneity across countries and across time uh, is really important. Also the timing of the way these, um, these loops work. So um, here's a picture that my colleague John Duca um, designed uh, showing how the household financial accelerator worked in the, in the US. So we start off with uh, falling asset prices, uh, the mortgage and housing prices at the top, feeding into lower residential construction on the far left, um, weaker consumption second from the left, and then of course, feeding back on the financial sector with uh, bad loans rising, the ability of the financial sector to extend credit is very much reduced, spreads in the credit markets tighten, and this all feeds into lower GDP growth and feeds back onto lower asset prices, lower capital of financial firms, and so on. I think most people recognize that story. So what are the implications for econometric models? Well, the FRB uh, US model, which is still around, is not a DSG model. Um, and its example is being followed in many places where banks are now thinking about non-DSG models. It's good on expectations. Um, I think it's very good on expectations, but I think it fails in other ways. And there are some important lessons there. It imposes the net worth constraint on consumption. In other words, consumption depends on the aggregate of assets minus debt, lumping all assets um, together. So liquidity and credit shocks can affect consumption only through net worth, given income. So that means the debt necessarily has a trivial role relative to housing and stock market wealth. 
missed the amplifying feedback loops via the financial system's ability to extend credit. And in 2007 at Jackson Hole, uh, Mishkin gave um, a presentation showing the simulations of the Fed model, um, which showed that um, I think it's a 0.25% fall in consumption relative to the baseline. So hardly a blip. Um, it's got unstable parameters. The speed of adjustment in the consumption equation, which is the most important equation in the system, uh, has almost halved in um, 10 years. And its slow speed is inconsistent with folk wisdom among central bankers about the real economy effects of monetary policy. So it's claimed to be micro-founded, but in my view, it's not a structural equation in the more fundamental sense of the Cowles Commission. And uh, the Fed model also lacks a decent residential investment equation. So how do we make progress? I think the encompassing principle is uh, a really important principle for thinking about how to learn from data. So for applied work, we need to formulate models that encompass alternative theories, um, but allow the possibility that by imposing restrictions on this general model, a particular theory might be supported by the data. Something that David Henry and his co-authors proposed in the 1970s. Um, and let me take the example of the life cycle permanent income model. Um, and show how you can generalize it and learn from examining the implied restrictions, relaxing the implied restrictions. So here we have log of consumption is equal to a constant plus the log ratio of permanent income to current income plus the asset to income ratio plus log current income. So that's uh, the best approximation, the best log approximation of the story. Now you can generalize that. You can break net worth into different elements, liquid assets, debt, housing wealth, financial wealth. Um, you know, most people think that cash is more spendable than pension wealth. Um, and we know from theory that housing wealth is different from, from other wealth because housing is a consumption good as well. Um, we can allow the coefficient on permanent income relative to current income to differ, differ from one. You know, the textbook says it's one, but if some consumers are myopic, it could be less. And moreover, the discount rate used to construct the discounted present value of future income should be far higher, and that's what the microeconomics and the buffer stock theory says, far higher than the conventional real interest rates that's used in, in textbook models. And then the intercept should be time varying. If down payments required for mortgage um, fall, saving for a down payment declines so that the consumption of income ratio can rise. And then because of shifting access to um, home equity, um, the coefficient on the house price effect or the housing collateral effect should be time varying. Um, so we find, for example, that in the US and the UK, it was pretty much zero in the 1970s. And then with credit market liberalization, it uh, rose very strongly. So what we need is a household equation system, because of course, once you condition on these assets and debt and credit conditions, you need to estimate a system of equations so you can, in terms of general equilibrium, um, solve forward by um, working through the portfolio effects uh, and endogenizing those. And uh, in our work, we extract credit conditions um, using a latent variable method. Credit conditions are latent variables from the same system. So in a ECB working paper on Germany and a new paper with, uh, that's being published um, with Valerie Chauvin, we estimate six equation uh, six equations for consumption, unsecured debt, mortgage debt, liquid assets, house prices, and permanent income. And for France and Germany, we find very clear evidence of this dampening mechanism that I was talking about. Um, for the US, on the other hand, we find powerful evidence of this amplifying mechanism, time varying, which is particularly strong in the upswing to the financial crisis, and then very strong in the downswing. And just to show you that latent variables um, um, really do what, what, what they're supposed to do. 
the latent variable picks up everything that is not being explained by the rest of the model jointly in a set of equations. So in the house price equation, the mortgage stock equation, the consumption equation, um, it's a latent variable in all three equations. Now, estimated from the French data, it turns out that it's incredibly close to the ratio, negatively, that is, to the ratio of non-performing loans relative to total bank loans. So the contraction of credit in the early 90s in France was very much connected with what was happening to the asset base of the banks, and then the subsequent improvement and the new contraction later on. Um, so, and of course, that also get, then gives you the connection with the financial sector. Um, the, you can connect what happens in the banking sector with what happens in loan conditions for the households, and um, that's an important part of the whole story. Right, so let me talk about uh, the other topic that central banks are particularly concerned with, which is inflation. Um, now, in a paper that Janine Iron and I published in 2013, um, we forecast PCE inflation in, in the US. Um, we looked at out of sample performance of different models, and um, our key insights are that inflation is partly a process of relative price adjustment. Now, that's not a new idea. Dennis Sargan, actually, um, in his famous 1964 paper, proposed exactly that. And uh, there's a great paper by David Hendry on the history of inflation in the UK with the same idea. What are the drivers? Well, unit labor costs, international prices, and the exchange rate, and house prices are key elements of the long-run solution. We find that including union density, um, a measure of labor market power, greatly improves the relevance of the unemployment rate. Now, because of the curse of dimensionality is such a problem in VARs, um, introducing a poor trade-off between the number of variables you can control for and the number of lags, um, we used a technique called parsimonious longer lags, PLL, to give a better trade-off. The key intuition behind this is that the impulse response function becomes fuzzier as, um, as lags rise. In other words, the precise timing of shocks, you know, it's a lag of 11 months or 13 months is not very precise, but there is an effect. So rather than ignore it, which is what the profession does, let's introduce it. And uh, the idea here is to, to replace 24 um, un unrestricted lag parameters by, by six. And that's shown in the slide here. And we showed that for every information set considered, PLL beats the Bayesian information criterion um, in terms of performance. And uh, in our latest um, work, which is still ongoing, we find a, a, a fifth insight, which is that the pricing power of firms matters for price setting, along with the union power for wage setting. There's a great paper by Roulon and his colleagues showing what's happened to the concentration ratio in US industry back to the early 70s. And uh, that measure is highly significant in our forecasting models. It improves in-sample parameter stability and out-of-sample forecasting performance. So our model, the long-run drivers of core US inflation are union density, the unemployment rate, foreign prices, house prices, and um, the Herfindahl concentration index. And under the combination of union density and unemployment seem to do a good job of picking up unit labor costs. So the implication is that there is a, let's call it the Sargon-Phillips curve, where relative prices and equilibrium correction play an important role, is stable. Um, and it turns out after three years of crisis, we're pretty much back to the model that there was before. Now here's a picture of um, what the model says about the impact of the concentration ratio, which is the red line, union density and the employment rate. And you can see the explanation for one of the things that's puzzled central bankers, which is in the, in the big, in the Great Recession, why did inflation not fall more? Well, our story is that in the US, part of it is because the concentration ratio rise, rose. Those firms had more pricing power to offset um, the weakening power um, in, the, in the labor market. Well, stability is a big question. Um, 
in our model, we can do recursive parameter estimates. And uh, reading from the top, we have the constant term, we have the uh, regression term for import prices, then we have um, house prices, um, then the Herfindahl index, and the unemployment rate, sorry, the unemployment rate and the union density. And you can see, recursively estimated from about 98, the parameters are really surprisingly constant. I mean, for an econometric model um, on inflation, I think that's rather good. So, we conclude that the New Keynesian Phillips curve is dead, but the Sargon Phillips curve is alive and well, given the right long run controls which include relative price adjustment and including market power relationships. There are a few other insights that come from this as well. Um, for example, the dynamics, or when you look at the details of the, of the adjustment process, very consistent with what we know about from the exchange rate path through literature about pricing in local dollar markets. And for forecasting, once again, averaging of the best model with a, a relatively simple also regressive univariate model is improves robustness. <clears throat> so we can get a considerable improvement in the forecasting performance. Now here's uh, a list of questions um, that come out of Janet Yellen's marvelous survey of issues and uncertainties uh, connected with understanding inflation. Um, is there a stable relationship between unemployment and inflation? If it's stable, what's the lag? What measure of labor market slack works best? Is the NIRU or the natural rate a useful concept? Does the inclusion of private sector inflation forecasts improve the model? And is there, well, and other questions, which I think we can all provide some answers to. So finally, to conclude, in macro heterogeneity rules, unemployment, for example, we know, is incredibly heterogeneous. It's one of the big inequalities in our society. But price setting behavior is heterogeneous as well. And yet, between these two heterogeneous objects, aggreg aggregations of heterogeneous objects, there is a relatively stable relationship. That's part of what macro is about. Um, I've made the point that the profession often neglects longer lags, and our technique is a very simple method. Anybody can use, anybody with a, a regression package can use to improve the trade-off between the range of variables considered and the range of lags. And then finally, I think the information economics revolution has highlighted the importance of credit and other liquidity constraints. And once you think about that, I mean, we know that, that the banking system has gone through a, a huge revolution. It's much more collateral based than it was before. So once you acknowledge that credit is important, and that shifts in credit have taken place, surely you want to take into account the shifts in credit availability in the macro models, the policy models that you design to understand financial stability better. And this latent variable technique that we've been working with for some years, I think is quite helpful in making the link between the banking system, credit, and household behavior. Thank you. Thank you, John, for being exactly on time, which uh, sets a uh, very high standard for all uh, next speakers. And uh, Roger, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I have some, uh, so uh, I, I'd like to uh, echo John's thoughts uh, about Vitor uh, and to thank him for including me. Uh, like John, uh, I've had many discussions or several discussions with Vitor uh, in which I would turn up in his office at four o'clock for a 15 minute discussion and then an hour and a half we'd still be talking about economics. If I'd known that uh, we could have also had a discussion about music, I'm sure we would still be there now. Um, so uh, let me say, uh, to start out with, uh, in 10 minutes it's difficult to do justice to everything that's in, in uh, John's very uh, interesting paper. Um, 
I, I'm going to draw on what I take to be uh, three themes. Uh, the first one that John did not say a huge amount about uh, is that clearly some of the, the DSGE models we've been working with uh, have not been particularly successful. Um, secondly, uh, John draws and mentioned a couple of people that he's, uh, uh, he's found very insightful. One, one is David Hendry um, and, and one is Joe Stiglitz, and I echo that. In fact, uh, in, my, in my first job at the University of Toronto, I didn't really have a thesis, and then I went to see uh, Joe Stiglitz give a talk, uh, and uh, my entire thesis ended up being inspired by that work. So uh, I, I share uh, the notion that there were some very important insights uh, in what we call the, the information revolution uh, in economics. And one of the things I'd like to talk about in this discussion is exactly what we can learn from that. Um, and um, my, my view is that what we learn is maybe even a little more radical than some of the things that John drew attention to. Um, and finally, uh, John provided some in, insights from his own work, uh, his empirical work, uh, and I'm going to, I hope, complement that, uh, agree with some of it, uh, and, and provide what I think are some important thoughts, particularly for policymaking, uh, when we think about the relationship between uh, inflation uh, and unemployment. Uh, there are a couple of things, or three themes, that I'll talk about. The first one I've alluded to, so exactly how should we think about introducing uh, information theory. And uh, there are really two ways, I think, in which it's important. Uh, and one's connected with the asset markets, uh, and the other is connected with the labor market. Uh, and um, if you start thinking deeply about what we've learned about market failures, my view is that uh, the, the lessons we should be taking away from information theory go a great deal beyond the idea that shocks become amplified. And in my own work, uh, I've really tried to go back to what I take to be an important idea uh, that was in Keynes's general theory and which became forgotten. Uh, and that is that market economies uh, are not self-correcting uh, and can, can get stuck with, with uh, uh, unemployment rates, which could be 20% for decades or 5% for decades. And the way that we ought to think about that in the language of modern general equilibrium theory uh, is that there are not just multiple equilibria, there's potentially a continuum uh, of equilibria. Um, and if you go away with that idea uh, and you think about the progress we've made about the empirics of Phillips curves, uh, I'm going to make the argument that um, there's a really important question we must ask ourselves because there's a huge amount of persistence in unemployment. Uh, in fact, uh, I'll show you some evidence which suggests that it, it's difficult to distinguish the unemployment rate in the US from a random walk. Uh, and when you take that view, the question then becomes, is it on the supply side because some object that's useful called the natural rate of unemployment is moving around? Or is it on the demand side, uh, in which case there's the potential for monetary policy not just to get us back to a better place more quickly, but to permanently influence the place that we're at? Uh, I'm going to show you a little bit of evidence here uh, from my own work on the connection between financial markets and labor markets. Uh, and what you're looking at here, the, the blue line um, is a measure of the real value of stock market wealth in the 1920s in the United States. The red line is the unemployment rate measured on the right axis on an inverted scale, so we're moving from zero to 30. Uh, and um, 
it, 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 it's, it's difficult to see uh, an eyeball chart which is as suggestive as that about a potential causal connection between uh, the asset markets and the labor market. Uh, if, you, if you shoot ahead uh, and you look at what happened in uh, the most recent recession, the picture is similar. The magnitudes are not as great. We're moving from 4% to 12% rather than from 0 to 30. But the, the, the notion of a causal mechanism between falls in wealth uh, and increases in unemployment uh, is, is, I think, a relatively easy one to take away from that chart. Uh, if you then ask, well, maybe those are special, uh, this is a picture from 1945 up through 2011 showing you the connection in those same variables over that period of time. Again, the stock market is measured in real terms. Uh, the unemployment rate uh, is, uh, again, uh, that's a, a transformation of the unemployment rate. Uh, and if you look at the, the time series properties of those two variables, you find that uh, even though the unemployment rate is bounded, you can take a transformation of it that maps it into the real line. That transformation can be a random walk and looks like a random walk. The real value of asset markets looks like a random walk. Those two objects are co-integrated, uh, and the co-integrating relationship between them has been very, very stable over the entire post-war period. Now, my view is that, that that is a causal relationship that operates through uh, a demand-side mechanism and not a supply-side mechanism. Uh, now, I'm going to show you some toy models to help you think about what th that ought to entail. So this is the kind of model that all of modern DSGE theory works with. It's what I call a rocking horse model. Um, and it, it has the property that after a shock, uh, the economy would return back to its growth path. Uh, if, and and the, the dynamics of a rocking horse model are a vector autoregression in which there's a, a stable point or a stable growth path which the economy is converging back to. Uh, the alternative is what I, I call elsewhere a windy boat model. Uh, it's, it's, so the economy is like a boat on the ocean with a broken rudder. Uh, and if, if the economy is like that, this is a description of what uh, is called hysteresis. So if there's a shock, as there is in this picture here, instead of returning back to the same growth path, uh, this economy returns back to a different growth path. So the interesting question is, is the economy more like the rocking horse or is it more like the windy boat? Uh, in, in the windy boat example, the dynamics of hysteresis are that instead of there being a point that the economy returns to, there's a set. So think of that as many, many potential equilibrium unemployment rates. And this is what happened uh, in, in the US data after the Great Recession. Uh, and in, in my view, that picture is a lot closer to the windy boat view than the rocking horse model. Uh, and there's a, a saying I learned to pick up in my adopted country in the United States. If it looks like a duck, swims like a duck, and quacks like a duck, it probably is a duck. Uh, the, the conclusion I take away from that is that, yes, uh, there's a lot wrong with the kind of GSG models we've been looking at. Yes, we can learn from the information revolution, but the kinds of things we need to learn from the information revolution are likely to have more profound effects than the work of simple DSGE models. And it leads to a key question, and this is where John's work on um, the dynamics of unemployment and inflation come in. I, I personally been quite critical of Phillips curves. I've argued that they don't they haven't really existed in data for really since they were Phillips wrote the first paper in 1958. 
uh, on the other hand, on the other side, there are people like Bob Gordon. I'm not quite sure where John comes down, uh, uh, whether he comes down on the side completely on the side of Gordon. Bob Gordon has been arguing that the Phillips curve is alive and well, that you can estimate a stable Phillips curve over almost all of the post-war period. But the way that he does that is by including the assumption that the natural rate of unemployment itself is a random walk. So the data has this non-stationary element in unemployment. The question we need to ask ourselves, is that non-stationary movement, that very persistent movement in unemployment, happening because of the structure of labor markets, which is causing natural rates of unemployment to go up, or is it due to some demand-side variables that we can potentially influence through monetary policy? And they obviously have very different consequences for the way that we should think about operating not just monetary, but also fiscal policy. Um, so again, I, I enjoyed reading John's paper enormously. Uh, I, 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 I've tried to give some complementary ideas um, that I, I've talked about elsewhere, and uh, I, I'm going to end with a simple plug uh, for where you might find them. Uh, and um, thank you.